25-year-old male, 211 is over Hollow Road, between Lane Road and Tom Patch Road. Welcome to Body of Crime, your go-to true crime podcast, where we plunge headfirst into the gripping world of criminal mysteries. Join your hosts, Jose Medina, Crystal Garcia, and Alicia Anaya, as we deliver the full stories, immersing you in the heart of each case. With spine-chilling cases, in-depth analysis, captivating interviews, and a comprehensive examination of the evidence, embark on a thrilling journey with us as we explore bone-chilling cases from around the globe. Whether you're a seasoned true crime enthusiast or a fresh face in the genre, we guarantee to keep you on the edge of your seat. So put on your detective hat, grab your notepad, and get ready to dive into the thrilling world of body of crime. I'd like to thank anybody who has been looking for my daughter and let's don't give up let's don't pull out let's, let's keep looking i, I want to keep searching for my daughter she's still out there somewhere and we need to find her so please anybody that's watching this please let's get her home and if the person or persons who took her i would like to say please bring her home our family needs her and if she's watching i love you baby we're still looking for you Haley Ann Marie Cummings was born August 17, 2003, a Leo, to Ronald LaMiles Cummings and her mother, Crystal Diane Sheffield, in Jacksonville, Florida. Although the couple never married, they would have two children together before separating in 2005, with Ronald Cummings Jr. being born on February 15, 2005. Being raised in one of the many socioeconomic challenged communities and as a result turned to criminal activity at a young age, in an attempt to escape his conditions. Sheffield would have found some source of security in Cummings and supported his criminal behavior and participated in his criminal activities and most likely became addicted to drugs in the process. Unfortunately, Haley was born with Turner Syndrome. Turner Syndrome is a genetic disorder that affects females and is characterized by the absence or partial absence of one of the two X chromosomes. The syndrome can lead to a variety of physical and developmental traits, which can vary widely among individuals. Some common features of Turner syndrome include short stature, a webbed neck, a low hairline at the back of the neck, and a broad chest with widely spaced nipples. Other potential characteristics include heart and kidney abnormalities, reproductive issues such as infertility, hearing problems, and certain learning disabilities. Early diagnosis and appropriate medical care are important for managing the symptoms and potential health issues associated with Turner Syndrome. Hormone therapy, growth hormone treatment, and other interventions can help address some of the physical and developmental challenges. Supportive care from medical professionals and a strong social support system can also contribute to an improved quality of life for individuals with Turner Syndrome. In 2005, while separating from Sheffield, Cummings filed for custody of both Haley and her brother. After Sheffield failed to take Haley to more than 12 medical appointments that she critically needed to treat her Turner syndrome. At the time, Sheffield had an injunction against her for domestic violence against a child and admitted to using cocaine. Full custody of both children was awarded to Cummings when Sheffield failed to show up for the hearing, a notice that Sheffield would later state was mailed to a bogus address. This would lead to tension between Cummings and Sheffield, and on March 13th of 2006, Sheffield would file a protective order against Cummings. The protective order would be dismissed 20 days later on March 23rd. Sheffield would continue to battle against addiction and eventually fell behind on court-mandated child support payments, resulting in an order for back child support in arrears for over $12,000. It is rumored that the stress of the back child support invoked a seizure in Sheffield. On February 6th of the same year, Joseph, or Joe Edward Overstreet, who was 26 and a cousin of Misty Jeanette Crossland, Cummings' girlfriend, who was 17 at the time, got into an altercation with Cummings over a gun. Overstreet was from Tennessee, but happened to be in Satsuma, Florida at the time. He would later be implicated by Hank Thomas Crossland, Misty's brother, who was 23 years old and went by the nickname of Tommy. 
Although Overstreet would be questioned multiple times, the police have not charged Overstreet or named him as a suspect. The next day, February 7th, would be the last day that Crystal would see Haley. On February 9th, three days after the altercation with Joe Overstreet, Haley was experiencing an ordinary day for a five-year-old and a kindergartner. Cummings and Misty Crossland dropped Haley off at Browning Pierce Elementary School in San Mateo at 8.40 a.m. They returned to their three-bedroom double-wide trailer in Hermit's Cove and slept until about noon. This was normal for them. At 3.20 p.m., Cummings met Haley at the bus stop as she rode home from school before he headed off to work. Cummings worked for the PDM Bridge located in Palatka, Florida. He arrived 45 minutes early for his shift. After he left, Haley rode her bike with her friends and practiced wheelies on the dirt road outside of her home. At about 5 p.m., Misty Crossland calls Cummings when the AC repairman shows up unannounced. Cummings speaks with him on the phone. Tommy Crossland and his children happen to be at the home at the time that the AC repairman shows up, but they all leave about 5.30 p.m. She cooks dinner for the kids around 6 p.m. and they spend some time watching television. At about 7 p.m., Teresa Neves, Haley's paternal grandmother, stops by the home to drop off some clothes and finds the kids sitting on the porch outside having dinner. When she hugs and kisses them goodbye, she doesn't realize it will be the last time that she'll see Haley. Between 8 and 9.30 p.m., Misty Crossland does some housekeeping and places one of Haley's blankets in the wash. She puts the kids to bed at their normal bedtime of 8.15 p.m. Haley goes to bed wearing a pink Hannah Montana shirt and panties, but the police report states that she was wearing tan shorts when she disappeared. At 8.30 p.m., Misty Crossland and Cummings get into an argument on the phone. In her anger, she turns her phone off and continues to wash clothes and clean up before the day's activities. At about 10 p.m., Crossland says that she physically sees Haley in bed, and she goes to bed at 10.15 p.m., laying down in the same room as Haley and Ron Jr., where Jr. slept next to her. There would be speculation as to what transpired after the children were supposedly laid down to sleep. Some would claim that Misty went out and left the kids alone. Others would say that Misty took the kids with her to a party. Either way, this would be the last time that Haley would be seen alive by anyone. It looks like Haley started off just being born into a tough situation to a mother and a father that were already involved in in drugs and drug trafficking and and other crimes. And then she's also born with the disease. Her mother's a drug addict. Her father's a criminal, a lifelong criminal. And Haley's got Turner syndrome. So Turner syndrome, even though, you know, you would think that it's purely genetic, they've done a lot of research that shows that it can be born from a narcotic addict. No way. Yeah. It says an abnormality in the offspring of a narcotic addict. So if at this point in time, Haley's mom was addicted to narcotics, that could be why Haley was born with Turner syndrome, which is unfortunate. And that's not far off to speculate that simply because we know that later on that Haley's mom was addicted to narcotics. It's part of the reason that she lost her children. So it's very possible that that could have been the case back then. And she was young too. Right. Obviously that's not going to be the only case. There's going to be people who aren't drug addicts who have kids who have that syndrome. If she would have been addicted to drugs at that point in time, which she very well may could have been, because we know that she was later, that could be part of the reason as to why she ended up with that. In 2005, when Cummings falls for custody of Haley and her brother, because Crystal Sheffield has missed multiple appointments for her daughter, this is treatment that she desperately needs. She misses these appointments and she doesn't have a job. So what is her excuse for missing these appointments? That's a good question. Yeah, she, she really doesn't work. Question, so actually. it's not like, she, you know, it's not like work is, is causing her to miss these appointments. Well, anyways, what ends up happening is that she ends up losing custody of, of her kids. She right. loses custody. That ends up resulting in her falling behind on child support payments. Right. And and I don't know if this was at that time, because obviously there's some years that passed in between when Haley went missing and when they split up. But I did read that one of the grandmas confirmed that 
Haley's appointments were only once every six months. And of course, when you're born with some type of syndrome or something of that nature that requires very intense therapy, generally that therapy starts off being a lot of appointments in the beginning and then they kind of start to spread out as they learn how your specific child is doing and what's required for your child. And I know specifically for her, she had some type of heart issues that she had to have monitored due to her syndrome. Um, She also had her eyes, if you notice in her pictures, um, seemed to be just a little bit kind of almost like offset. That was also part of her syndrome. She had stubby like fingers um, and toes due to the syndrome. So she had a number of different things that she kind of dealt with from the time she was born until she went missing. So on February 6th, when Joe Overstreet comes into the picture, he's Misty's cousin. Misty is Cummings' girlfriend, his underage girlfriend, by the way. Mm-hmm. His second time that he is in a relationship with someone who's underage that we know of. Um, Crystal was also underage when she got pregnant. He gets into he gets into altercation with Cummings, and it seems like Joe is kind of bad news, it seems like. What do we know about Joe Overstreet? All of his stuff really is drug-related, all of it. So he's got numerous like drug trafficking charges and just all different types of, of drug charges. I saw a lot of things that were dismissed. I'm not sure why that is. I don't know if he had a really good attorney. I don't know what the case is there. You know, you're trafficking drugs and you're making a lot of money and can afford a pricey attorney that can get you off on a lot of things. But he definitely had a lot of stuff that was dismissed. And then you have Tommy Crossland, who is the brother of Misty. Three days after the altercation, we have the day of Haley's disappearance. And on this day, it looks like it starts off like a normal day for Haley. She goes to school. She comes home. Her dad goes to work. Everything's like it should be. We have a couple strange occurrences on that day. We have the AC repairman that shows up at the house unannounced. I feel like it really throws Misty off. And she kind of calls Cummings and, and gets him involved in why he's there. Then you also have a couple people that stop by the house. You have Tommy and his children that show up at the house. Mm-hmm. That's her brother. So her nephews and nieces show up and they hang out. Who else shows up at the house? I believe that Overstreet showed up at the house as well that evening. There's been some talk that there might have been some a couple other unidentified individuals as well that evening. But I haven't seen any indication as to who those other individuals were. The grandmother was also there too. She came to drop off some clothes. Right. So she was also there too. That was uh, Teresa Neves. And she seemed to be a, a consistent in... In Haley and Ron Jr.'s lives. She was, you know, the grandma that took them in when neither parent could have them. And she's the grandmother that just really kind of stepped up when things were going on. And so she was a constant in their lives. So as the day goes on, it looks like Misty starts doing the the things that a parent would do with their children. She's cleaning up. She's cooking for the kids. She's feeding them. They spend some time watching TV. And then at around somewhere between 8 and 8.30, she puts them to bed And then she gets into this argument with Cummings where she turns her phone off. And to me, there's some concern there. What are your thoughts on that situation? Well, you can always ignore your phone. I'm not sure why you would turn your phone off. That kind of seems just to me, unless somebody's just really, really blowing up your phone, you know, why you would turn your phone off. And I'm pretty sure that he wouldn't be blowing up her phone when he's at work. So that seems odd. It almost seems like it could be a cover for doing something else. But, you know, the police would be able to see if she dropped off a network, if she shut off her phone. So they would be able to see the amount of time that the phone was off the network. And has there been any any evidence pulled from her phone records that show that maybe she was somewhere else or that she wasn't at home at the time, the disappearance of Haley? No, and honestly, I think that if they had found anything in her records that indicated anything of that nature, that it would have been something that came out. Now, I don't know for sure whether or not they went through her phone. That's a good question to see if if that was something that they even did. But definitely if they did it and something of that nature came out, that would have been something that was publicized. So Haley goes to bed. What becomes a little bit disturbing at the time that Haley disappears is Misty's story. So Misty has several different stories that she shares in terms of where Haley was when Haley went to bed and where she was when she went to bed. What are your thoughts on that? A couple things. So she's 17 and normally at 17, you have a pretty darn good memory. I will say that. 
when not you're, when you're doing drugs. <laughs> no, not when you're doing drugs. But generally, when you're recalling information that's so close, so you're not recalling something that was a week ago, two weeks ago, even days prior, you're talking about something that occurred within the last 24 hours. Generally, your memory for anybody is going to be pretty sharp. And little details, especially when something so significant happens, typically you remember those. So, I mean, and just imagine yourself if you're a parent and you're talking about your kids gone missing and you start thinking, okay, well, I know I usually watch a show at this time. And so I know it had to be about eight o'clock when I put my kid to bed. I saw that they fell asleep in the bed. You know, those details are pretty like people are able to recall those details. So those little things are little things sometimes that come out when somebody's being dishonest. On the morning of February 10th, Missy Crossland wakes up around 3 a.m. to use the bathroom or get a drink from the kitchen. The story is varied. She finds the kitchen light on and the back door of the trailer is propped open with a brick. When she returns to the room, she notices that Haley is missing from the bed. She begins to look for Haley. She would later tell the police that the door is always locked. Cummings arrives from work at 3.25 a.m. and tells Missy Crossland to dial 911. I just woke up and my back door was all open and we sitting on the door. Okay, what's your address? Um, three lane. Dead. Okay, when did you last see her? Um, we were just like, you know, it was about 10 o'clock. We were, she was sleeping, like, she was cleaning. Okay, how old is your daughter? She's five. <laughs> okay, what was she what, last seen wearing? <laughs> Ma'am? She was in her pajamas. We were sleeping. Okay. All right. You said your back door was wide open? Yeah, it was brick. Like, the brick on the floor. Like, when I went to sleep, the door was not like that. Okay, the back door... Listen to me. Your back door was wide open. What are you talking about, a brick? Yes. What, what is the brick? It's on the back door, on the, on the stairs. Like, we have, like, a walkway. Uh-huh. And there was a brick laying there? Yes, it's still there. They are. We, we got them coming. Tell them we got them coming. They're coming. Okay, what's the color of your house, ma'am? It's blue. It's blue? Okay. Yeah. Okay, what What does she look like? How tall is she? Give me some description of her. Oh, she has, like, like, long hair, curly, like, curls. Long, and curled, what, what color? Oh, um, she's white. Okay, what and color is she? Brown hair? Brown hair? Yeah. Oh my God. Oh. Okay. How tall is she about? Or how much does she weigh? Do you know that? Like four or something. Like, I don't know. Like, she's not that tall. Okay. Wait. Tell, tell your husband we got him coming, okay? Okay. How much does she weigh? Do you know? Um, like 40, 50 pounds, 60 pounds. 40 to 60 pounds? Yeah. Okay, let me get your name and phone number. My name is... Is that your last name? <laughs> okay, was your, was your back door locked, do you know? Yes, the back door always stays locked. Okay, I need somebody to get here coming. now. Okay, let me speak to him so he can... Yeah, 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 yeah. I just got home from work. My five-year-old daughter is gone. I okay. need somebody to be here okay. now. I'm Listen telling to me. you. Listen to me. We got two officers. If I find whoever has my daughter before y'all do, I'm killing them. I don't uh, care. Okay. I'm going to rest okay. my wife in prison. I'm telling you, you can put it on record, and I don't care. Okay, it's okay, sir. We got them on the way. Okay, can you give me any what kind of description of her pajamas that she was wearing? I don't fucking know. I don't work. Okay, sir. We got them coming. Okay. <laughs> Missy Crossan's story would later fluctuate in terms of where Haley was sleeping in relation to her. Originally, she would say that Haley was asleep in the same bed as her inches away, and later she would change that and say that she was in her own bed, a crib mattress on the floor, approximately four feet away. Immediately after calling the police, Cummings called his grandmother, Annette Sykes, shouting, My baby's gone, my baby's gone, get here, my baby's gone. Sykes would later recall the frenzied call. By 3.30 a.m., Cummings' mother, Teresa, is on the scene and helping in the search for Haley. She brings an 8x10 photo of her granddaughter to help find her. The timing of her arrival is odd, as she lives 15 minutes away, and although she continues to repeat that Haley is just hiding, 
It appears more self-affirmative since she has a photo to help Felice identify the girl. Two sheriff deputies arrive at 3.40 a.m. to find Cummings standing in the driveway in a frenzy. He's shouting expletives and threatening to kill whoever took his daughter. Authorities begin the process of notifying Sheffield and her mother, Marie Griffiths, as they investigate the crime scene. Crystal and Marie Griffiths would not arrive until later in the morning, showing up around noon, almost eight hours later. There's no forced entry on the back door that both Cummings and Missy claim to always be locked. There was a cinder block propping open the back door and a blanket. When asked if it was possible that Haley left on her own, Cummings shared that there was no way she would have wandered off into the night because she was afraid of the dark. By 9.30 a.m., an Amber Alert goes out for Haley. More than 130 local, state, and federal officers, as well as local volunteers, ascend into Satsuma to search for Haley using all resources available to include hounds, helicopters, and water units encompassing a five-mile radius around Satsuma, Florida. This search would continue for weeks with no clues as to what may have happened to Haley. Two days after Haley's disappearance, a canine unit searching for Haley follows her scent from the double-wide trailer that was her home to the St. John's River. Dive teams waste no time jumping into the St. John's River to begin looking for signs of Haley. They would come up empty-handed. So Haley disappears. In the video that we will put on YouTube, one of the things that we're going to show you is the walkthrough that's done that's publicized by the Nancy Grace show. One of the things that she does is she has somebody on site in the trailer home who is giving you a look at Misty's story, basically. And so you get to see where the bed's positioned as opposed to the crib mattress, how far apart they are. I got up because I had to use the bathroom, but I didn't make it to the bathroom. I seen the kitchen light on. And I walked in the kitchen and the back door is wide open. I mean, I didn't notice about Haley that then until I seen the back door open. And then I go in the room and she's gone. And that's all I know. I just want everybody to know that I didn't do anything with that little girl. I loved her like she's my own. And I'll do anything to get her back. One of the things that came out early on is that the initial story that Misty gave was that she got up to go to the bathroom. Well, there's a bathroom in the bedroom. So the first question was, did she have the door closed? Because she mentioned seeing the kitchen light on. And how did she see the kitchen light on if she was in the bedroom with the door closed? You wouldn't have been able to see the light on. Possibly you would have been able to see the light on if the door was open. But when she talks about seeing the door open, if she was getting up to go to the bathroom, she wouldn't have seen a door open because she would have been going into the bathroom, into the room that she was in. So then there's another story that comes out, and that story is, I went to get a drink, which would have obviously taken her into the kitchen. Then she goes into the kitchen. She notices the kitchen light on, which she didn't leave on. She sees the door propped open with what she called a brick. We find out later that that's a cinder block. And in this video, one of the things that you see is that they test the door. So there's a regular door, and then there's a screen door. It was the screen door that was propped open with the cinder block. The main door... First of all, to even get open, Haley wouldn't have been able to open it. You really had to, it was kind of a difficult door to unlock and to open. So I don't think that Haley would have been able to do it. Now, obviously, could an adult who was in there earlier in the day have done that? Yes. But the other thing about the doors as well is that they automatically close. So I don't believe that you would have seen a door open, not unless the other door was propped open, which it wasn't. And it actually closed kind of hard. So I don't even think that unless you happen to close it gently, that it wouldn't have been completely sealed. So you would have actually had to open the main door to even see that the screen door was propped open. So those are some of the holes in Misty's story that have been brought up. And I think legitimately so. The other thing is that she says that she didn't see Haley missing until she returned to the room. And... She literally would have been facing the bed and turning out of the room when she walked out of the room. I don't know how you wouldn't have noticed that she wasn't in the bed. So that seems strange as well. Yeah, that seems very strange. I can't imagine getting up in a room where I'm sleeping with my kids and not noticing that one of them isn't there. I can't even imagine that. Yeah. And I think, you know, early on, like when your kids are little and like you have any of your kids in the bed with you, when you like kind of move the bed to get out of the bed, like 
you realize that they're there, they're not there, right? And so for her to have initially said she was in the bed with her and then to say she wasn't, it just is odd that her story changed as much as it did. Yeah, there, there's a lot of inconsistencies in the story. Now, I would say if she left the kids home by themselves and she was coming home from partying at three o'clock in the morning, right before her boyfriend shows up from work, she would see the light on. That would be odd to her. And she would see the door if it was left open, if it was propped. And she could have left her phone there off. Yeah, she sure could have. So there's a lot of parents, especially single parents, who will do things and leave their kids asleep in the car, asleep at the house. Especially if she's just going like across the street. Right. Like, you know, if she's not going far. If she's like, if some guys are outside partying and she's having friends and neighbors that are partying and the kids are asleep, to think that, well, I'll just go over to the friend's house and then I'll just pop back over and check on the kids. That is something that people do. Right. And I'm it, not saying I ever did that, <laughs> but it is something people do. Right. You know, the other thing, too, is that, you know, the family talked about Haley being scared of strangers. If somebody came in who she didn't know, which it didn't sound like anybody really who was in the house was anybody that she wouldn't know, I would think she would even know Overstreet. So for somebody to take her out, they were saying that just like you wouldn't be able to get her out of there quietly. And then. Also, she was scared of the dark, so right. her venturing out would have been highly unlikely as well. Right, right. Now, it is possible if she woke up afraid and she was looking for Misty and not finding her, that she would have went outside looking for Misty, but would she have gone through the back or would she have gone through the front door? I don't think she would have gone through the back. And the reason that I say that is because... From just the various stories that I've heard of like even the grandma being there and them eating out on the porch, which is in the front, like a covered porch. So it wasn't mm -hmm. like they were sitting out in the open. Everything they did had to do with the front of the trailer. And right. even Cummings at one point had said that that when they were asking him about the cinder block, he's like, I don't ever go back there. So they were renting and he's like, I don't know what's back there. Like it would have been unfamiliar. And I don't think that she would have tried to venture somewhere that was unfamiliar to her. Yeah, I don't think so either. I, I don't think her natural state would have been to go through a door she never goes through right. because she wouldn't know what to expect. And if she was looking for somebody, she would have went through the front door. So it's very, very, very unlikely that she tried to venture out through the back door. Right. And the other thing too, is that with all that movement, I think that the brother, the little brother, he would have been about three at the time. Yeah. I think that he would have like woke up crying. Like there would have been a lot of movement and a lot of sound. And at that point in time, somebody else would have gotten involved because yeah. of the time of, of night that it is like people would have heard kids crying or screaming or, sure. you know, whatever, even if Misty wasn't there. So. Yeah. So Teresa sh arrives very quickly and people find that odd because she lives 15 minutes away. She gets there very fast. She gets there with the picture. It is my opinion that Misty called Teresa before she called Cummings because I think her initial response when she couldn't find Haley is she called her boyfriend's mom. Well, that doesn't seem so odd to me. So in your initial panic, you got to think she's 17, yeah. right? These aren't her kids she's freaked out and if you hear cummings later you know how he is like right. mentally i'm sure she was nervous about even indicating in any way that she couldn't find one of his kids right so i don't think that it's far off for her to have called his mom first and said hey you know i can't find her and to, to get some guidance you know yeah. to get some some guidance from her and go from there and that makes a lot of sense because we find out that as soon as cummings arrives he calls his grandmother Right. Which he doesn't call his mom. He calls his grandmother, meaning his mom's already on her way or she's already there by the time he gets there. Right. So he's so calling, he knew. Yeah. He had to have known. The authorities begin notifying Haley's mom, Crystal, and Haley's maternal grandmother, Marie Griffiths. And supposedly there was numerous calls, like 12, like somewhere around 12 right. was the number. And that's between Crystal, her mother, and also her father, I guess, at one point they tried to call as well. And I'm not sure how that went because I'm, I'm trying to think of the mentality of like, I know if you were to call me and tell me that my kid was missing, I would be there right away. Now, I don't know if this was something that's occurred before in their family. I don't know if you're used to that other parent being a little bit Oh, you're making a big deal. I don't know if any of that was part of the thought process for Crystal and Crystal's family. I can't imagine that it would be because I don't feel like this is a, we don't lose our children every day. Right. And when the police call you and the police say your child is missing, yeah. it's not like a parent calling you going, yeah, hey, I can't find Johnny. 
You yeah. know, this is the cops calling you saying your child's missing. I'm sure they're leaving voicemails. I'm sure somebody went by the house. There's just nobody coming and they don't show up for eight hours. You know, and I had heard some things as far as her like not having a vehicle or her having to get like somebody to take her and those different kind of things. Um, so I don't know what all those details are. We had 130 volunteers that came down <laughs> to look for Haley. Someone could have stopped by and picked up Crystal and her grandmother and drove them to the house. That's very true. Okay, at 9.30 a.m., the Amber Alert goes out for Haley. People show up and start looking for her and they don't have any clues. They have the bloodhound that takes everybody to the St. John's River and the dive team jumps in. What do we know about the dive team? What do they find? The dive team doesn't find anybody and they don't find any evidence whatsoever to indicate that anything of Haley's was in the water or around the water. And so because of that, they came up empty handed and during that time frame. So with all the different volunteers and stuff that they had to come in, so they developed a program that they activate whenever there's a situation where they consider it to be an abduction. And so in this situation, because of the story that Misty told and how she told it, they were under the impression that this was an abduction. And so they activated that system as it was an abduction. And so the EquiSearch team, who's out of Texas, who was started by a man whose daughter went missing, he came out with his team to aid in the search as well. And it was actually his team who had done some testing with Misty, a stress test and also a polygraph test as well in addition to whatever it was that the police did and he said that based on her results that she was 95 to 97 percent deceptive in the questions that were asked indeed she did and in fact she asked to take this polygraph in order to clear her name now the last time we spoke on your program we talked about a message that was issued by the putnam county sheriff's office in a press release on haley's sixth birthday that asked the public to come forward with any information they may have had on misty cummings whereabouts the night the child disappeared they said the story had been inconsistent now it appears that misty had asked to get this a polygraph taken care of through Tim Miller with Texas EquiSearch. He arranged a team and, like you said, flunked with flying colors. And on top of that, still some more inconsistencies arose from some of the stories she told them. And that's according to the Putnam County Sheriff's Office, who's received copies of this so far. And one of them is uh, with that timeline once again where she claimed she put Haley down at 8 p.m. and herself went to sleep at 10 to wake up abruptly at 3 to find Haley gone. Well, guess what? Uh, Ronald Cummings says uh, that bed was made. didn't appear that anybody had been to bed, and it kind of contradicts a few things that have been mentioned earlier in that stream of inconsistent stories. So, so a lot of things Ronald happening really Cummings, fast. Cummings with me, T.J. Hart from WSKY. T.J., are you telling me, let me get this straight, she says she wakes the little. She realizes the little girl is gone at 3 a.m. The yes. little girl's bed about three feet away from her own. But Ronald Cummings comes home from the night shift and the bed is made up? That is what we are being told of the results of the questioning that took place over that two-day period. From the time that Haley disappears, there will be hundreds and eventually thousands of tips called in, with the detectives facing the insurmountable tasks of sorting through the noise and trying to find those pieces of information worth following up on. On the 21st of February, after being missing for almost two weeks, detectives announced that Overstreet... Misty's cousin is not a potential suspect. On March 9th, 2009, exactly one month to the day that Haley goes missing, Cummings and Misty are issued a marriage license after dating for just six months. They get married three days later. Misty's parents, Hank Thomas Crossland Sr. and Lisa Carmen Crossland, are required to sign authorizing the union as Misty is still underage. The local church refuses to conduct the ceremony, citing that they do not agree with the union. The reward for information leading to the whereabouts of Haley reached $26,500. The marriage, however, will be short-lived as Cummings files for divorce 30 days later after Misty Crossland failed a polygraph and stress test. By August, leads are growing colder. On August 7th, Cummings is arrested after he gets into a fight with Tommy Crossland. In September, Tommy would be arrested for grand theft of a handgun and his mother will be arrested for forgery and petty theft. Detectives will use this opportunity to question both for the disappearance of Haley. 
On September 19th, a pond south of Palatka will be drained as the detectives continue to chase tips and leads to the disappearance of Haley, but continue to come up empty-handed. On September 25th, Christina Nene Pravat will tell detectives that she had been out partying with Misty on the night of Haley's disappearance and that Haley took an Oxycontin pill. The detectives later rejected this theory. On October 7th, Cummings announces the divorce to the world, citing the conflicting accounts of Misty's alibi and her failed polygraph as the primary reason in addition to the stress of Haley's disappearance. On January 2010, Cummings, Misty, and Tommy Crossland, along with Donna Brock and Hope Sykes, are charged with drug trafficking and an undercover drug bust, with the group being caught trying to sell 330 pills of Oxycontin and Hydrocodone. As Tommy Crossland maneuvered for a deal, a private detective, Steve Brown, just north of Wallaca, Florida, claiming that Haley's remains are in the river. Divers spend the next three days searching for the remains of Haley and again come up with nothing. On April 15, 2010, after more than a year of Haley's disappearance, Sheriff Jeff Hardy transfers Haley's case from missing persons to homicide, stating that he does not believe that Haley is alive. He will also claim to have persons of interest related to the crime. Of those people, they would mention Misty Crossland, who was in jail for drug trafficking and might be breaking under the strain of facing real time, and Tommy Crossland, also jailed for drug trafficking and willing to talk as well. Ironically, Overstreet's name would come up again around this time, and when the police would move to question him again, Overstreet will request a lawyer, limiting the detective's ability to question him further. Over the years, Haley's grandmothers, Teresa Neves and Amanda Sykes, would continue to cling to hope that their granddaughter is still alive, citing other similar cases of disappearance where the child is later returned. Between Misty serving upwards of 25 years and Tommy Crossland 15 years in prison for drug trafficking, both have attempted to plea and make deals to be released early, with the real story lying somewhere between their lies and their desperation for freedom. So this investigation is still ongoing. It is. It really sucks that they get so many tips that it overwhelms the system. And you can't follow every single one. There's just no way to follow every single tip. But they really had a a very high concentration of tips for certain things. So there was a high concentration of tips indicating that Misty was at a party and that Haley had taken something. There was a high concentration of tips that Haley was dumped into a body of water. And those were all things that they followed up on. There was even a tip at one point years later where a transient had said that she believed that she was Haley Cummings. And so they did DNA testing and it wasn't her. Throughout all of those things that they've checked out, even when they they were in one of the rivers at one point, and I know that there's video of... Misty Crossland out on the dock with them pointing as if she's pointing to where something had occurred. She says that when they brought her out there, that they brought her out there and showed her animal bones, trying to tell her that they were Haley's bones, basically trying to get her to to break down and confess. And she's to this day stated that she doesn't know anything yet somehow in the midst of, you know, her getting in trouble, she was trying to push things over to, Hey, Overstreet did something. And so I do believe that somewhere within those individuals that the truth lies. And I think it's unfortunate that the family doesn't get closure because nobody is speaking. I know that the police wanted to solve this case and they've talked about this case. Even, you know, the majority of the ones who worked the case are no longer with the department. Either they've retired or moved on or something. This is a a case that's close to, you know, a lot of their hearts. She was a young, beautiful little girl. So Cummings marries Misty, which I think it's bad timing. I think it's a bad taste. You know, your daughter's missing for less than 30 days. You're going through this whole crisis. You decide to get married. It just, it seems bad, like bad timing. And then he files for divorce 30 days later when she fails the polygraph. I almost wondered early on, and this could have been that somebody suggested that he do this, but that he did it so that he wouldn't have to testify against her so that he could try to get information from her. But I don't know that. And I don't even know that he would have been that strategic, honestly. 
Yeah, that se- that sounds like like a storyline for a movie. <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't even sell 330 pills of Oxycontin without getting caught. I don't think he can <laughs> plan this elaborate like spy novel like <laughs> They had actually at the at the time, which is another interesting thing as well because they were conducting a sting operation during the time that Haley disappeared. And so I don't mm. know how much information they might have had in the process of that, like they could have been actively doing surveillance during this time. So I don't know if anything came out of that during that time, but like they had already been watching them during this time before they got in trouble for the drugs. Whatever did happen would have had to be something that was spontaneous. It couldn't be something that was planned or communicated via telephone because if there was already a sting operation going on, that means that phones were already tapped. It means that there was already surveillance over certain people in terms of how they were moving and when they were moving and things like that. So if something did happen, it would have to be something that was very spontaneous and then not communicated in any kind of writing or any kind of text or any type of phone calls because all of those things would have came to bear in the investigation, I feel. That makes me feel like that maybe that theory of the overdose or potential overdose is maybe a possibility. And that could be part of why, because the police really, everybody who worked on the case really feels like that's the most likely scenario is that she got a hold of a pill accidentally, they got scared and they dumped her body. And um, that's a very likely scenario. Now, the police do a good job of continuing to pursue leads and continuing to question. And even when they get in trouble and they start doing the arrest and they bring like, for example, when Tommy gets arrested and they bring him in and along with his mother and also his father, and they get the opportunity to question them a little bit more. And so they use that opportunity, but it looks like Overstreet is a little smarter than the average bear. He gets brought in and he immediately lawyers up, which is what we say. It's the right thing to do. Right. It is. So there's a video of him being interviewed and he's smiling the whole time. Yeah. And I know a lot of people view that as being like a sign of guilt, but for a lot of people, smiling can be a automatic reaction when they're embarrassed, when they're nervous, when they're all of those things have high anxiety because they're being shown on national television. And so that may not be an indicative of anything, but if you do see that video, which that'll be part of, you know, the video that we publish as well, but, What you'll notice is that he does come off as looking kind of sketchy. Yeah, sketchy. Yeah. Smiling sometimes is a coping mechanism. Right. When you're feeling stress. Right. It's a way to cope. And so just having that reaction doesn't necessarily mean that you're guilty. And also lawyering up also isn't a sign of guilt either. But then I would have questions about how did his polygraph turn out? Did he take a polygraph? Did they look at his phone records? What did they use to eliminate him as a suspect? He says he was with family members at the time that this all happened. Right. But then Tommy says he was present. See, and but then you got to think too, is that the Crosslands have a long history of getting in trouble. Yeah. Like that's, I can see that they would band together and go against Overstreet because he's not part of their immediate family. I can totally yeah. see that. But also, I believe that specifically in this case, that there's some things that haven't made it out publicly that they know that they're building on because they don't have enough probably at this point in time to prosecute somebody. But I believe that they have a decent amount of information, Yeah, but they just don't have their smoking gun yet. Yeah. Especially if the crime was an accidental death. And the other thing too, is that one thing about water is that it eliminates a lot of potential evidence. If they were to find Haley Cummings body in the water there wouldn't wouldn't be much to go off of, you know. No, but but it would corroborate the story that is coming from Tommy Crossland and Misty Crossland. So if their story was that Overstreet threw the body in the river, finding a piece of her in the river would prove that that this is a true story. Right. If that was the case and the death was accidental, Misty would still be facing some type of a murder charge for accidental overdose of the child, whether it's a negligent a homicide or, or whether it's manslaughter or whatever, because that overdose would have been exposure to an illegal drug that she wasn't supposed to have. Right. So there is still a murder there, even if it was accidental, but it would fall on Misty, not on whoever got rid of the body. Right. Right. That's true. I do want to mention that. So typically in a missing persons case at the one year mark, they start to look at whether or not they're going to consider it to be 
a homicide case or missing persons case. And the reason for that is because it enacts certain triggers at that point in time. So if there's life insurance on the table, the life insurance can be released. If, you know, the investigation is being worked as a missing persons and it involves certain resources, but you need additional resources for homicide, it can trigger those additional resources. So there's a number of different things that go into making a determination like that and why they would do that and why it makes sense. So it's not just a matter of, okay, we've like given up on this case and we're going to go ahead and push it over to homicide. You know, there's a number of different things that come into play whenever a decision is made to switch you know, the case type over. And she's still listed on the missing persons website and everything. So it's not like they've blacked her out and they're just going to have her over here as a homicide case. They just did it more so as a, as a method to engage some other things that are available to them. Many theories abound about what could have happened the night that Haley went missing. If we were to take the grandmother, Teresa Nevis, theory that someone probably followed Haley home from the bus stop after seeing how absolutely precious she was and potentially unable to have a child of their own, that they may have come back later and taken Haley to be raised as their own. This is a highly optimistic theory that relies on the goodness of a person capable of taking a child from their parents and raising them in a safe and nurturing home, and it's a very unlikely outcome. If we take the theory of Nene Pravitt, then Haley was out partying with Misty and Nene and potentially overdosed on an oxy pill. In a panic, Misty may have orchestrated a scheme to avoid being charged with negligence and the death due to accidental overdosing. She may have worked to dispose of Haley's body alone or with the assistance of her delinquent family members who are already at odds with the law and not above criminal behavior. This is a potential outcome, but is it a likely one? I don't know as Nene only came forward in an attempt to reduce her own jail sentence and therefore had a biased reason for telling her story. If we go with Tommy Crossland's theory, then Overstreet borrowed a family member's van and took Haley while Misty hid with Ron Jr. under the covers, placing Haley in a bag and then throwing her into the St. John's River. This is a highly possible scenario since we know that Cummings and Overstreet had tension and had been involved in an altercation. Overstreet's grandmother doesn't seem surprised when Tommy Crossland tells her that Overstreet is responsible for the girl's disappearance. She almost anticipated it. Unfortunately, a snitch's testimony is viewed as biased and self-serving, and so Misty's, Nene's, and Tommy's stories are all just fabrications without the ability to find any solid evidence. We may never know what truly happened to Haley, who would have just turned 20 this year, but we'll continue to keep her story alive and seek the truth related to her disappearance. What theory do you subscribe to, Crystal? I don't think that anybody maliciously murdered her. I think that she got a hold of something or something occurred, and I think that they panicked and got rid of her body. I tend to side with the theory that the police have in that she probably overdosed on something, got into something that she wasn't supposed to, or maybe even had something happen like something could have caused her to have a seizure and they freaked out and thought she was dying and dumped her. So I think that that scenario is is highly likely. And given the stories that have come out, what we know to be true and what we know to be just varying stories that have occurred. And then, you know, how we know that how Misty's polygraph test came out. I think that there's a very high probability that it was an accident and that they dumped her body. I agree with that theory. And I would even say that just by the fact that she's suffering from Turner syndrome, it could very well be that she had a medical situation that happened and it maybe never was an overdose. Right. It could have just been a medical condition that caused her to have some type of an episode where maybe she passed out or had a seizure, like you said, or she could have got into Misty stash or coming stash, whatever they were dealing with in terms of Oxycontin or whatever. It is highly probable. The truth lies in one of those other two theories of either she had some type of a medical condition that that kind of presented as her passing away or her being unconscious or or something to that effect. And potentially the brothers coming in, the cousin and the brother coming in to 
where to help Misty get rid of the body. And there's a number of things. Like, I don't know if they tested Misty at the time to see if she was on anything. And so you're definitely not going to make a very good decision if you're on anything at the time either. But I definitely think that Haley's medical situation would have played into anything that she would have taken. I know that I had a situation with my daughter where she, along with her regular medication, had taken another medication and had a seizure unlike any seizure I've ever seen. You would have thought she was passing away. So in a situation like that, especially at 17, I could see a young girl getting super nervous and thinking like I did something. And, you know, if I call 911, they're going to say, oh, well, she got a hold of this drug. And why did you have this drug? I'm pretty sure that there was a thousand things going through her mind during the time of something happening. That's a great point. I would even venture to say she was probably more afraid of Cummings. If he would have came home and found his daughter deceased and would have blamed Misty, I think Misty probably was terrified of that. Oh, I think so. When you hear him and even seeing his, you know, his past records as well, he has a... A violent streak. A very violent streak. Yeah, he's a very aggressive person. And even, you know, one of his latest incidents had occurred where he had just gotten out of prison after his 15 year sentence and he was found drunk in a car passed out. And when the police tried to wake him up, he wrestled the police for his gun, tried to get the officer's gun away. He just, you know, I, I think we've all done that before. Uh, no, <laughs> not me <laughs> ever. <laughs> not me. Either. Um, but yeah, you know, and so you can't just sum up, you know, who he is as, you know, he grew up in a rough area and he grew up without money and he's just trying to survive. Like he made a lot of decisions that put him in the lifestyle and in a risky environment. Like he made those decisions. And yeah. then, you know, the repercussions of those decisions made his situation worse and made his situation worse for his child. Even with his situation with Misty, he met Misty at a school bus stop. Misty yeah. was taking her nephew to the school bus stop. That's how where he met her. You know, it's my understanding that she started babysitting for him before they officially became a couple. Right. And so now you've got this 17-year-old in there taking care of your five-year-old and, yeah. you know, your three-year-old. Like That you barely know. Right. And not to say that, you know, like I know that for all my daughters when they were 17 would have been probably better than most adults I would have trusted, you know, to watch kids. But Still, you're not an adult, and you've got a young girl in there having her act like a mother to your children, and I don't know that that was the smartest decision. Yeah. You know? And I don't know that that Misty did not act like a child would have acted. Even right. when I see her in pictures, she looks like a child to me. Well, and one thing I think is important about Misty, I think, to bring up as well, is that she couldn't read or write. She dropped out of school in the sixth grade. And even that, like you think about, I wouldn't allow my kid to drop out in the sixth grade, but that's the type of family that she grew up in. Yeah. So they were into drugs and into illegal activity and, you know, and then willing to sign your daughter, you know, sign for your daughter to get married at 17, especially during an international case like this, like just, you know. To a person with a criminal record on top of that, like he was already into crime and well, like so everybody knew family. what he was about, like, you know, something tells me that they were intertwined yeah. at that point. In yeah, time you're probably anyways. right. You're probably right. Criminally. Like, yeah, that's probably true. But it stinks because stuck in the middle of all of this is a young girl who didn't deserve to have her life ended at such a young age. Yeah. And, you know, I don't believe and, and I know that the police, you know, ruled him out right away. I don't believe that Haley's dad had anything to do with her death. I don't think so either. And I think it's a, you know, the whole situation is a tragic outcome of the lifestyle, unfortunately. Some bad choices. Yeah. Yeah. We do hope for some new evidence to come forward so that we can have a resolution on what happened to Haley. And I think he deserved that. You know, he may not have made the best choices. I don't think he deserved to have his daughter go missing. And no, I don't no. think he deserved to have his daughter found in a body of water somewhere, dumped. Yeah. You know? Yeah, she definitely deserved to be buried and put the rest the, the way that her family would have wanted. It's a really tr sad and very tragic story. Any last words? As always, thank you for suggesting cases. This was a case that was suggested to us in one of the true crime groups on Facebook. Thank you. This was a great case to look into and I believe a case that deserves to be solved. 
and close so that the family can have closure and the community can have closure. So thank you for suggesting this case. We appreciate it. We may never know what truly happened to Haley, but we'll continue to keep her story alive and seek the truth related to her disappearance. And that's a wrap on today's investigation, fellow detectives. If you found this episode both enlightening and captivating, then please subscribe to our podcast show and our Patreon. Leave a review and hit that like button. Share our podcast with others and engage with us on our website and social media platforms. You can find us on all major podcast platforms as well as our website at www.bodyofcrimepodcast.com where you can access all of our episodes and bonus content, including valuable resources. By expanding our community, we believe we can make a greater impact in our pursuit of truth and in shedding light on crucial cases. If there's a case that you'd like for us to cover or a personal story you'd like to share, please don't hesitate to contact us through our website. We always welcome your feedback and suggestions. Until next time, stay sharp, and thank you for tuning in to the Body of Crime Podcast. Podcast. Bye.